Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Dana Bowen, one of the chief residents here at University Hospital. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping tips. Uh, please keep your mics muted and your videos off during the presentation. Um, and also, please hold your comments and questions till the end of the presentation. And lastly, I will put any of the CME information in the chat box, and it may also be uh, in the pre presentation as well. Uh, today, our speaker is Dr. Ami Pachawala, joining us from the Division of um, Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine to give a presentation on the updates and progress in tuberculosis. Dr. Pachawala is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Rutgers at JMS, and she serves as a Medical Director at the Global TB Institute and is also Program Director for the Pulmonary and Crit Care Fellowship. She also serves as a representative for the American College of Chest Physicians on the Advisory Council for the Elimination of TB. Dr. Pachawala is PI and co-investigator for dozens of grant-funded research projects in her areas of interest, particularly the diagnosis and treatment of latent TB and TB disease, as well as management of non-tuberculosis mycobacterial infections. We welcome you and thank you, Dr. Pachawala, for joining us today to give this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much to you and um, Dr. Klappholtz and Deaver. Um, so I'm going to speak about um, some recent updates in tuberculosis and uh, talk a little bit about COVID as well and its impact on TB. Um, this is your CME information again. These are my objectives. Um, we'll do a little bit on the recent trends in um, national TB uh, and global TB epidemiology. Um, and then really focus on what we, um, what we know and what's been updated in management of latent TB infection, um, as well as in the treatment of um, active TB. And then, as I said, we'll spend a little bit of time because it's really hard to avoid talking about COVID and its impact on TB. Um, so likely you've seen this slide before. This is um, the CDC uh, data that is released yearly in March on World TB Day and shows us um, the number of cases over the last 30 or 40 years or so. Um, and as you can see, we've had a pretty nice decline since the 90s when we really had a resurgence of tuberculosis. Um, and uh, over the years, we have We've had a steep decline um, in the early 2000s and the late 90s. And over the last 10 or so years, you can see that our rates of TB, while in the US are pretty low, have really plateaued. Um, somewhat concerning is that in the last year, uh, in 2020, you can see a really steep drop off in the number of cases of TB reported in this country. Um, and that's something that we've really seen mirrored throughout the world. Um, and it's very concerning. Likely these are missing cases that have not been reported um, because of disruptions in healthcare and because of COVID-19. Um, and TB, as you all know, is a pretty slow moving disease. So it may take some time before we see an uptick again in the incidence of TB. But, but rather than being a positive thing, this is likely something that's, that's a very concerning trend. Um, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, and just to really magnify the last 10 years or so, these are our rates of TB. So rates of TB are generally reported in the number per 100,000 population. So we've been around the low three per 100,000 in this country for the last decade or so. Um, some slight declines in the few years before COVID and then a really steep, about 20% decline in the rate of TB uh, after COVID. Um, again, probably not surprising to you, but these are the states in which we see the highest rates of tuberculosis. So New Jersey is right around the average um, in 2019 for the country. Um, we see much higher rates in Hawaii and Alaska. Um, but the vast majority of cases in this country come from these four states, California, Texas, Florida, and New York. Um, if we look at the incidence rates of TB cases, and again, this is active TB, um, and we split it up by people born in the US versus people born outside of the US where the endemic rates of TB are higher, um, you can see that over the years, there's been a decline in both. So blue, 
in the blue line here are um, um, people born outside of the U.S. and the pink down here, which are quite low, um, are the rates of TB in people born in the U.S. Um, and if I magnify, or if the CDC actually magnifies this for us, um, you see that again in 2020, the rate dropped about 20% in the U.S. born and 18% in the non-U.S. born. So it was really similar across the board. Um, I, this is a point I like to highlight. I think many of us uh, learned that when people immigrate to the U.S., um, they develop, if they're going to develop TB, they develop TB very early on in the first few years of their arrival. Um, and you can see that the percentage of cases are higher uh, amongst our more recent immigrants, but about a third of cases reported every year in the U.S. Um, occur in individuals who have been in the U.S. for more than 20 years. Um, and so this is something that I think we really need to pay attention to when we screen and evaluate latent infection. Uh, we'll talk again about this a little bit more, but we know that in the U.S., the vast, vast majority of active TB comes from uh, latent infection. So not from recent transmission, but from people who have been latently infected for many, likely many years. And so we have time in these individuals to pick up their latent infection and treat them uh, before they develop TB disease. Um, this is looking at HIV co-infection, uh, which has dropped over the past 20 or 30 years uh, amongst people who have active TB. You can see that the highest rates um, are in our 25 to 44 year olds. Um, and then looking at some other risk factors, um, diabetes uh, is a, it carries a slightly higher risk of progression from latent to active TB. Um, and that risk is about, you know, that occurs in about, diabetes occurs in about a quarter of all patients with active TB who are non-U.S. born and 14% in U.S. born. You can see the risk of recent transmission, so contact with somebody who has infectious TB, is much higher amongst our U.S. born population. Um, and then these are just some other risk factors that are highlighted. So of all cases of active TB, about 9% uh, have excess alcohol use reported. Homelessness is about 4%. And correctional facilities, we still, this has really not changed over the years. We still have about a 3% rate um, of all TB coming from correctional facilities. So focusing a little bit more on New Jersey, um, and these are 2020 numbers, you can see again that in New Jersey, we've averaged about 300 cases a year for the last decade or so. Um, some slight trend uh, in terms of uh, uh, decline in cases, and really, again, mirroring what we've seen in the rest of the country, only about 245 cases reported in 2020. Um, our, um, uh, our demographics reflect what we see in the rest of the country with um, the majority of our cases and people born outside of the U.S. And then really tiny down here um, are the cities in New Jersey with the highest rates of TB. So you can see that Newark um, is in there as well as Edison, Elizabeth, Jersey City, and Patterson. And again, these numbers are very small. But in Newark, we had about the same number of cases in 2020 as we had in 2019. But in many of our other higher burden areas like Jersey City, there were only about half the number of cases reported in 2020. So I'm gonna move on from sort of that, you know, baseline of what we know about recent trends in TB epidemiology um, and talk about, you know, get into a little bit more depth, depth with um, testing for latent TB infection, um, new treatment guidelines that were released in 2020, and, and some ongoing trials and trials that are in progress. And then we'll talk about TB disease. Um, and there have been some very exciting developments in the last year or two uh, with shorter, uh, shorter treatment regimens. Um, and then I'll end up talking about COVID and its impact on TB. So traditionally with latent infection, I think we've really been plagued with a difficult and unwieldy testing strategy. We've used the tuberculin skin test for decades, um, and, and while it's been a good 
test and it's been you know good in terms of screening latent infection in our population um, it has many challenges um, as i'm sure you all know treatment <clears throat> for latent infection has been um, problematic it, it, in the past is very long treating for nine months uh, in individuals who are asymptomatic um, and as a result we have really limited adherence and treatment completion um, and that adds a tremendous burden to people who are trying to treat uh, TB infection and, and the people that we're treating. So there have been several advances. I'll focus really on um, test, new testing recommendations, blood-based testing with IGRAs, um, and then the new treatment guidelines for latent infection, all with the hope of really improving adherence. Um, so uh, as I've mentioned, uh, our rate of active TB in the U.S. is really at a plateau. Um, our rates, however, remain quite high as far as getting close to our goal of TB elimination, uh, which is considered what, less than one case per million population. Um, 80% of TB disease in the U.S. is due to reactivation, and much of this, we think, is late reactivation. Um, based on surveys, our rates of latent TB have really not declined in the U.S., so anywhere from about 4 to 5 percent of people in the U.S. have latent infection. Um, so in order to keep, you know, getting close to our goal of eliminating TB, we really obviously need to focus on infectious TB, which our public health sector has focused on uh, over the last very many decades. Um, but we really need to expand detection and treatment of latent TB infection, especially in our higher risk groups. And this requires not just public health, um, but primary care and, and community health providers um, to really sort of step up and screen and treat for latent infection. Um, latent infection management remains a challenge. Um, if anybody uh, has tried to treat somebody through nine months of isoniazid, you know that that's very tricky. Even with our shorter regimens, adherence can be limited. Um, <clears throat> In a meta-analysis done back in 2016, looking at um, management of latent infection in outpatient settings, um, they, they evaluated sort of each step of the process from screening the patient for latent infection <coughs> all the way down to completing their treatment. And you can see that at each point along the pathway of completing treatment, you lost a good number of individuals. Um, so, you know, these people were intended for screening, but only about 70% actually got their initial tests done. Um, only about 43% of patients completed their medical evaluation. And then at the way end here, people completing treatment, that was less than 20% of the original population. Um, and so there are many points, I think, where we can intervene um, in this cascade of care to try and improve our outcomes. Um, so, I'm going to focus you here on the box on the left. So, there are what seems like many, many rules for who we should test and who we should not test. We really want to focus testing for latent infection um, on people who are at highest risk. And so, if you look at these three groups, birth, travel, or residence, and travel means uh, travel or residence is really more than spending more than a month. Um, in that country. So um, birth, travel, or residence in a country with an elevated rate, um, a, a, an elevated TB rate. And you can see that, you know, the U.S., Canada, and most of Western Europe is excluded. Um, any other uh, country, that individual should be screened at least once. Um, people with immunosuppression, so either HIV infection, an organ transplant recipient, somebody who you plan on putting on a TNF blocker uh, or other immunosuppression, uh, other immunosuppressive medications should be screened with a test for latent infection. And then the third group are those who are in close contact uh, with someone who had infectious TB. So this really covers the vast majority of the people that we want to screen and test for TB. If they fit into one of these three groups, we should be um, evaluating them for symptoms. We should be planning on which test we will use, and then we should test them and then move on to treatment. 
In terms of other individuals, so these are people who are at high risk to have been infected with tuberculosis. There are people who are infected who are at higher risk to progress to active TB. And those are people with diabetes, with chronic kidney disease. Um, the risk of smoking is about one to two fold or one and a half to two fold higher than non-smokers in terms of progression to active TB. Um, so those are other people that I would consider testing if, especially if they have one of these other risk factors. Um, avoid testing low risk people. Um, and then the last bullet point here is about healthcare workers. So the newest guidelines uh, from the CDC suggest that we no longer routinely uh, uh, annually test healthcare workers. This is a very low group. There may be a few groups that uh, you feel are at highest risk and perhaps continue to screen them um, annually. But the recommendation is that on hire, everybody should get a baseline symptom assessment, education, and um, have a test for latent infection. And then after that, really only if there's been some sort of exposure um, or if there's been some other intervening risk that puts them at, um, at, at uh, potential for having been infected with TB. Um, so we no longer annually screen uh, for latent infection. Um, <clears throat> so what about the actual test? Um, there is no gold standard or definitive test. Uh, in terms of, of testing for latent infection. All of our available tests indirectly assess for the cell-mediated immunity that you develop after you've been exposed to um, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, we've used the tuberculin skin test, or PPD, for a very long time. The interpretation is based on the size of the reaction to the, to the tuberculin um, antigens. Um, and is also based on risk factors. So if you're at highest risk, um, let's say you're immunosuppressed, then the smallest in duration in your, in your reaction would be a positive uh, versus somebody who basically has no risk and you would interpret them as being positive only at the highest in duration or the largest in duration. Um, it does require some technical expertise, but probably the biggest issues are that it requires a follow-up visit um, and it cross-reacts with uh, the BCG substrains that we use in BCG vaccination outside of the U.S. and also uh, with some with non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. Um, so those are really the limitations of PPD. Um, more recently, in the last 10 years or so, we've really been um, moving more towards interferon gamma release assays. These are blood-based assays. Um, being sort of uh, represented here. One is the T-spot TB, and the second one is the quinoferon TB Gold Plus. Um, both uh, use whole blood from the person that you're testing, incubate it with antigens from TB, as well as a negative control and positive control, and then measure the amount of interferon gamma released. So if interferon gamma is released, then that patient has likely been exposed to TB at some point in the past and their immune system is responding to that. Um, it is a blood test, which some people don't prefer, but all in all, the logistics of the test are easier. There's no cross-reaction with BCG and most non-tuberculous mycobacterias. I would say, you know, in practice, um, many of our um, patients that we see at the Lattimore practice tell me, the first thing they tell me is that my PPD is positive because I had uh, the BCG vaccine. Um, and blood tests do seem to inherently be a bit more believable. Um, and so that often helps people understand that they're truly infected and why they should take treatment. Um, it does require some lab expertise. While the logistics may be easier in the clinic, um, the lab does have to work on their protocols to make sure that their, um, that their results are accurate. Um, <clears throat> this is a graphic of how um, uh, sort of the mechanisms behind the IGRAs. Um, again, in vitro blood tests, and you're measuring interferon gamma release um, from T cells that have been stimulated by specific TB antigens. Um, these are a list of different mycobacteria. So you have all the 
tuberculosis organisms up here at the top. The BCG substrains are your vaccines, uh, our BCG vaccines and all the different vaccines that are used. And then the bottom list are our non-tuberculous mycobacterias. And the antigens that are used in the IGRAs are these two up here. Um, and as you can see, what I'm highlighting here is that the antigens we're using are present in all of our MTB organisms, but not in the BCG substrains. Um, unfortunately, there are a few non-tuberculous mycobacteria that do carry these antigens, so M. kansasii, marinum, and zolgai, and those may cross-react. So you may still pick up a positive IGRA in somebody who's actually not MTB infected, but rather has M. kansasii, but that's relatively unusual. Um, <clears throat> in terms of sensitivity and specificity of the IGRAs, the quantiferon and T-spot TB do have slightly greater sensitivity, but really not much of a difference compared with tuberculin skin testing. The real win with the IGRAs is in people who've been BCG vaccinated, the specificity of your IGRAs is just much higher um, because you're, if they've been BCG vaccinated but not TB infected, their IGRA should be negative. So the general rules of LTBI testing are really to choose uh, to not test people who are at low risk, to use those high risk groups in that um, box that I showed you, um, um, and to choose one test. So either the tuberculin skin test or the IGRA. Generally, we wouldn't do both. Um, IGRA is preferred if the individual is BCG vaccinated or if they're unlikely to return for a second visit. Um, you can use IGRAs in children two years old and above. Uh, I believe some pediatricians will go even lower. Um, the test choice really depends on your practice, what's available, um, and the cost, although that's becoming less and less of an issue. Um, at the Lattimore practice, except for very young children, we are really primarily uh, using the uh, T-spot TB test. Um, very occasionally, we will recommend a dual test approach. So, if you tested a low risk person and they come back positive and you're worried it may be a false positive, then we may recommend doing a second test in that individual. And if it's negative, to count them as a negative. Um, on the converse, you may do a second test in somebody who has a really high pretest likelihood of having TB infection or at risk for progression, like somebody you're gonna start on a TNF blocker. Um, and if you get a negative test, but you really think that they have a high risk of having been infected with TB, you may opt to do a second test in that person so as not to miss a false negative. Um, so I'm gonna move on to treatment of latent infection. Um, and, and the bottom line is that the shift in guidance is to use shorter regimens and our uh, rifamycin-based regimens in order to, um, to improve adherence and completion of treatment for LTBI. Um, and that's really the bottom line of the updated guidelines that were published in 2020. Um, so these are the five reg regimens that are recommended. The first three are preferred regimens. So that's using three months um, of isoniazid and rifapentine weekly for 12 weeks uh, or four months of rifampin given daily. And the third regimen is a bit new to us, but it's not a new regimen. And that's using isoniazid and rifampin daily for three months. Um, not a lot of data for that third regimen in HIV negative individuals. Um, and you can see that the regimens that we were used to using for, for many, many years, um, isoniazid given daily are alternative regimens. So, bottom line, our shorter treatment options are the ones that are preferred. So, I'm just going to go into a couple of details about the shorter course regimens. Um, the benefits of four months of rifampin are that it's generally well tolerated. There's less hepatotoxicity compared with an isoniazid regimen. Um, and adherence is clearly better. So, uh, in a study that uh, was done at the Lattimore practice some years ago, 
54% of people completed their isoniazid and 69% completed their rifampin. And in, a, in, in at least one head-to-head -head study, the efficacy is similar. Um, the issues with rifampin, as you all know, is that there are many, many drug interactions, oral contraceptives, warfarin, methadone, buprenorphine, uh, certain antiretrovirals. Um, and as well as steroids um, and, and other things that people may be taking chronically, those drug interactions can be, uh, can be major barriers. Sometimes we cannot use rifampin in these individuals. Other times, um, like if they're on a stable dose of prednisone, we may be able to adjust the dose and continue with the rifampin. Um, there are, um, uh, there are uh, guidelines for using antiretrovirals and rifampin. I always look at them because they change frequently. Um, and uh, this is a really helpful um, uh, website to look at the drug interactions. If you do have significant drug interactions with rifampin, you can consider using four months of rifabutin instead of rifampin, which is a weaker P450 cytochrome inducer. Um, and so you may have uh, better results with that. Um, and then these are just the dosing and the number of doses that the individual will take. So isoniazid and rifapentine is the newest regimen that we've been using pretty successfully. So this is a 12 dose regimen. You take isoniazid and rifapentine weekly for 12 weeks. Um, and obviously the benefits are that it's the shortest regimen that we have. Uh, pills are only taken once a week as opposed to weekly. Uh, again, in, um, in a study comparing the 12-week regimen to nine months of isoniazid, 12-week regimen was non-inferior. Um, and adherence and completion were much better. So 82% completed this regimen as, as opposed to 69% uh, who took nine months of isoniazid. There is less hepatotoxicity uh, with the 12 dose regimen, not zero, but less. Um, the downsides at this point, I would say, are the pill burden. So because of the way rifapentine is formulated, most adults have to take 10 pills at once, but again, they're only taking it once a week. Um, we don't yet have approval for children under two, um, but two and above, uh, you can use this regimen and the rifapentine and isoniazid are, dose, are weight adjusted uh, using the weight bands up here. Um, uh, it is not recommended yet in pregnancy. Um, and uh, if the person has HIV and they're on uh, either efavirenz, dolutegravir, or reltegravir-based regimen, they can be uh, placed on the 12-dose rifapentine regimen, but most other um, uh, antiretroviral regimens uh, may not be compatible. So again, uh, these are just interactions to look up uh, when you are uh, treating somebody with HIV on antiretrovirals. The drug-drug interactions are similar um, to rifampin. So again, hormonal or um, IUD-based uh, uh, um, hormonal um, IUDs like the Mirenas and things like that, they will also not be as effective when you use them with the rifamycin. Um, uh, similarly, methadone and buprenorphine, you may precipitate withdrawal in those patients. Um, and so if somebody is on either methadone or buprenorphine and you want to use a short course treatment regimen, I generally opt for rifabutin. Um, um, there are some small studies showing that rifibutin will not induce withdrawal um, in patients on methadone or buprenorphine. Um, this, the, the adverse effects with the 3-HP or 12-dose regimen um, are fairly few, but in the studies, they did see some systemic drug reactions or flu-like reactions in about 4% of the people taking this regimen. Um, mostly, they were mild, and the individual could continue and complete the regimen, but it is something to look out for. Um, cost and availability is probably the biggest issue right now. There are both rifapentine and rifampin national shortages at the moment. Um, and there are likely multiple reasons for this. Uh, with rifapentine, one of the main issues is that there's really only one manufacturer right now. And so availability can be a bit of an issue. Um, but hopefully there are um, pathways to improving the drug supply.
Um, INH and rifampin is not a regimen that we use very often for latent infection, um, but you can give both drugs daily for three months. Um, and that's sufficient to treat latent infection. Hepatotoxicity of this regimen is probably similar to six months of uh, six to nine months of isoniazid, um, and the efficacy is likely similar as well. Um, so, as I said, our isoniazid daily regimens are really no longer the preferred regimens. Um, if you do give isoniazid for some reason, um, six months is sufficient. Um, and this was a change that was made in the 2020 guidelines. We're all used to giving nine months. Nine months has actually never been directly studied. Um, in very old studies, 12 months of isoniazid was compared to six and was slightly better in terms of efficacy, but also comes with lower adherence and potentially more hepatotoxicity. Um, so all of this really imbalance favors um, uh, six months of isoniazid. So if you have drug interactions that, you know, you can't, um, uh, if you have drug interactions that uh, are barriers and preclude a shorter regimen, or if, the individual is a contact to a case who has really unusual but rifampin monoresistance, or for some other reason they can't take a rifamycin, then you can give six to nine months of isoniazid. And going beyond six months is really something that we've been individualizing. So if the patient is taking their isoniazid and they have no side effects and uh, they seem to be adherent and willing to, to go on, and they're at somewhat higher risk of progression to TB disease, then by all means, you can continue to nine months. But if somebody, you know, showed up tomorrow and said, I took my six months of isoniazid a year ago, do I need to come back and take nine months? The answer would be no. Um, adverse effects, I think we're all familiar with. Um, you can get an asymptomatic LFT elevation um, in up to 20% of people on isoniazid, which is why we usually don't routinely check liver function tests. True clinical hepatitis is much rarer, although um, does increase with age and other risk factors as well as other medications. Um, the likelihood of hepatotoxicity with the rifamycins is significantly lower. Rifampin, you can get um, some cutaneous reactions. Most of these are self-limited and can be treated topically. Um, occasionally, we will see a thrombocytopenia or a leukopenia. Again, that's pretty unusual. Um, and other hypersensitivity reactions can occur but are rare. The main adverse effect we worry about with the 12-dose regimen are the systemic drug reactions um, that I mentioned. Um, the rates of hepatotoxicity are quite low. Um, so, again, the overall risk of serious adverse effects, even with isoniazid, is pretty low um, and even lower with the shorter rifamycin-based regimens, again, leaning us towards using more of the rifamycin regimens. Um, so, you know, in sum, for latent TB treatment, you, for, for adherence reasons, liver toxicity reasons and, and efficacy is equal, um, we really wanna focus on using those three to four month regimens. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick mention um, to treating latent infection in some of our more complicated patients. Um, so we certainly see a lot of people here with advanced liver disease who are peritransplant. We know that the risk of active TB if they're latently infected is very high. Um, usually, this occurs via reactivation in the first year post-transplant. Um, we also know, of course, that it's very hard to treat these people with isoniazid, especially before transplant. Um, in very, very small studies, really their case series, rifampin and the 12-dose regimen were used safely in cirrhotics. The mean meld in those people was around 15 to 17. Um, Ideally, we want to treat latent infection in this population before transplant, but that's not always possible. Post-transplant, we're limited um, because erythromycins tend to interfere with most of the immunosuppressants that are being used. Um, you can use isoniazid once the liver function stabilizes, but the, um, the downsides, again, are that the course is pretty long. So, um, 
there has been uh, some use in the literature and in practice uh, with fluoroquinolones, um, in, especially in this population. We don't have any real good data. The data that we have is that we know that fluoroquinolones like levofloxacin and moxifloxacin have good activity against MTB. They're a core part of our drug-resistant TB regimen. Um, in the liver transplant population, there's really very, very little data. Um, what little data there is suggests that the adverse effects with fluoroquinolones exist, but are lower um, than either using rifampin or isoniazid. And we really don't see much fluoroquinolone induced liver toxicity. Um, so this is a possibility for some of our patients. We have used it, I would say, a dozen or so times uh, when treating um, uh, some of our pre-liver transplant patients, and most have done okay. But again, not a lot of information. Um, so just my last couple slides on latent infection, and then I'll move over to TB disease. Um, this, you know, dichotomy between latent infection and TB disease, I think, is something we're, we've all heard about, we're all familiar with. If you have latent infection, you're not sick, you have a normal x-ray, you can't find the bacteria anywhere, you have a positive skin test or IGRA. Um, and, you know, one out of every five people globally has latent infection as opposed to somebody with active TB who's sick, who's contagious, who can spread TB to others and has an abnormal X-ray, and that's much less common than somebody with latent infection. So the thought about sort of the, the pathogenesis of getting to active TB has really changed quite a bit. Um, and as opposed to having this true dichotomy, there's probably multiple steps along the way um, between somebody having exposure to TB, potentially clearing the infection, um, but still having an immune response if you were to do an IGRA, versus somebody who has what we call incipient or subclinical TB disease, where the bacteria that they have are becoming more metabolically active. Um, and those are the people, the ones with incipient TB, who are really at highest risk for progression to active TB. So the, the current positive predictive value of the test that we have is very low. It's in the single digits of being able to predict somebody who is going to progress to active TB. We know that we likely treat people with latent infection who will never progress to active TB. But at the moment, there's really not a better test uh, for identifying that higher risk person. So that, that would really be um, a, a key testing priority is to uh, develop a test or find a test or a biomarker that can really identify those people that are just on the edge um, before they develop active TB and treat them. Um, so looking ahead with latent infection, um, biomarkers um, are a, a place where there's been a lot of work and ongoing work looking at mRNA signatures in whole blood and cytokine candidates to try and identify those people with incipient TB who uh, are still latently infected, but their bacteria are a little bit more metabolically active. Um, and to really search for diagnostics and therapeutics that can target these uh, target these stages of the disease. Um, other treatment trials that are um, in progress. Well, so actually the brief TB trial is one month of daily isoniazid and rifapentin um, that was done in. Um, uh, in Africa in HIV infected individuals um, and that is actually completed. Um, and that was non inferior. So that's a 1 month regimen. Um, but the data that we have is only in people with HIV. There are multiple other trials uh, that are in progress. Um, both for drug susceptible latent TB, as well as looking at the fluoroquinolones and some of our newer drugs like delaminid um, in people who have been uh, presumably infected with MDR TB, but are still latently infected. Um, and these trials, as you can see, are quite short, one to two months of duration. So those would be big game changers as well for treating latent infection. I'm going to move on and talk about TB disease in the last 20 minutes or so, um, talking first about drug-susceptible TB treatment. Um, 
so, you know, those of you who have been practicing medicine for a while know um, that TB treatment for active TB really hasn't changed very much in the last 40 years or so. Um, in the 60s, uh, we were treating TB with INH, ethamutol, and streptomycin. Um, and that took our duration of treatment for drug susceptible TB from 24 to 18 months. In the 70s, uh, we had rifampin, and that was added to the three drug treatment, and we got duration down to nine months. Um, and then in the 80s is when pyrazinamide was introduced, and we were able to fur further shorten treatment to six months. And so we've been using this four drug sort of quote unquote modern regimen for drug susceptible TB since the 80s. Um, this year, uh, just in the last few months, a uh, new trial has been published that I will talk about, um, and that's a four-month treatment regimen for drug-susceptible TB that was non-inferior um, to our uh, traditional six-month regimen. Um, there's nothing really wrong with the six-month regimen in controlled settings, like in the U.S., where our public health um, manages TB well. Uh, we have more than a 95% success rate with the six-month regimen. Globally, in, um, in differently resourced areas, the success rate is a little bit lower, maybe around 85%. Um, we know that some people need more than six months uh, to decrease their risk of relapse. But we also know that many of our patients are likely cured well below, before that six-month mark. Um, and the long treatment duration remains a barrier to treatment to completion and adherence, and it remains a burden for patients who have to stay in care um, and on medication for that long. Um, there have been uh, several prior trials looking at four-month treatment regimens, um, uh, three of which I listed here, so Remox, Oflutub, and Rifaquin. These were all fluoroquinolone-based trials. One also used rifapentine. Unfortunately, all of these trials were non-inferior to, uh, to the traditional six-month regimen. But when you pull the analysis of all of these shorter course four-month regimens into one analysis, you saw that about 80% of the patients were actually cured with the four-month regimen. Um, and non-inferiority was seen in people especially with minimal TB disease, um, of which we have a lot in the U.S. Um, so, it seems that there is really a signal for being able to shorten treatment and move away from, from six months for everybody or six to nine months for everybody. Um, so, those prior trials were not successful. They were not non-inferior to the six-month regimen. Um, so, the regimen, the four-month regimen was strengthened um, by using moxifloxacin uh, throughout the four months. Um, and replacing our less potent drugs like ethambutol. Um, but we also knew from those prior trials that moxifloxacin alone, substituting that in was not enough to really shorten treatment. So then we looked to the rifamycins and we looked specifically to rifapentine, which is more potent and has a longer half-life than rifampin. Um, in prior trials, rifapentine alone, substituting it for rifampin also did not seem to make much of a difference, um, but likely we were using uh, too low of a dose of rifapentine. So putting a higher dose rifapentine together with moxifloxacin um, was the study that actually became successful, and that's uh, the, this study here, so four months of rifapentine um, and moxifloxacin. This is study 31. It was a um, effort between the TB trials consortium and the AIDS clinical trials group. There were over 30 trial sites, 2,500 individuals older than 12 years old. Um, these are the exclusions, and they randomized patients to either the six month um, traditional. Uh, INH, rifampin, PZA, ethambutol arm, uh, or to an arm that replaced rifampin with rifapentine, um, or a third arm that replaced uh, rifampin and ethambutol with rifapentine and moxifloxacin. The patients were pretty sick. 70% uh, had cavities uh, and extensive disease. Almost all of them were smear positive. Their BMI average was around 18. These are the three arms. They were followed out to 12 months, and that's the data that we have so far. 
um, and the primary endpoint was survival free of TB for 12 months. Uh, the secondary endpoint hasn't been reported yet. That's going to uh, that that will be 18 month data. Um, so what were the outcomes? Uh, so the combination rifapentine moxifloxacin arm was non inferior to our control. Four months of rifapentine without the moxifloxacin did not meet non inferiority. And maybe most interestingly, in all of the pre specified subgroups, so HIV, people with cavities, um, different countries, um, uh, there was really no difference in the outcomes. Um, there were perhaps some subgroups where the rifapentine alone arm, the second arm without moxifloxacin, um, was non inferior. So, in people who seemed less ill without cavities and lower grade smears. Um, safety, the data was quite good. There was really no overall difference in grade three or higher adverse effects. There was a little bit more hyperbilirubinemia, probably from the rifapentine, um, but they did not see a signal for drug induced liver injury. Um, and there was one possible borderline QTC prolongation seen um, in the rifapentine moxifloxacin group. Um, so, this was big news, and um, this is something that has been really exciting in the TB community. It's the first regimen that's been shown to be non inferior to a 40 year old regimen. Uh, it's four months as opposed to six months. The strengths of the study are that it was a diverse study population. The patients were ill, um, and so it may work even better in a less ill population. Um, and there was really no increase in the hepatotoxicity seen. Some of the limitations were that only 8% of the study population had HIV. Um, there were very few diabetics uh, in the study. Pregnant women were excluded. Um, and we have yet to see if the, um, if the uh, duration of cure is long lasting with the 18 month data. Um, implementation of this regimen will really uh, be the next big hurdle. Uh, so, in order to get there, we really need to focus on getting some rapid molecular based drug susceptibility testing, especially for the fluoroquinolones, right? You would not want to use moxifloxacin without knowing that the person was susceptible um, to fluoroquinolone uh, starting out. Uh, as I mentioned before, rifapentine availability and formulation is a bit of an issue right now, but there are, uh, you know, many pathways in progress to try and improve the rifapentine supply um, and to also reduce the pill burden. The dose that was used in the four month study was 1200 milligrams of rifapentine daily. Um, and that is a, a handful of pills because they really only come in 150 milligram pills at the moment. Um, and guidance from both WHO and CDC are, uh, are, are to be published soon. Um, but we do plan um, here in Essex County and at the Lattimore practice uh, and are working on implementing this shorter regimen. So I'm gonna move on and talk just a little bit about drug resistant TB. We don't see a lot of drug resistant TB here in the US. Um, I'm sure that what you've heard about it is that it's a horrible disease and nobody would ever want to have to suffer through the treatment of either MDR, uh, uh, multi-drug resistant or XDR, extremely drug resistant tuberculosis. Treatment is excruciating, um, can be 18 to 24 months long with four to six different medications, including an aminoglycoside. Um, leading to hearing loss, nephrotoxicity, and um, injection site pain. Um, this is a, a, a tweet from a TB advocacy group, uh, Deaf or Dead, the unbearable choice for some TB patients. And there'd been a lot of advocacy around um, this issue of people with MDR TB globally. Um, you know, only about 50% historically have survived their illness. Uh, and those that survived were often left uh, without hearing. Um, in 2019, 2018, 2019, um, there, was, uh, there were new guidelines published both globally from the WHO and the CDC um, looking at new and repurposed drugs um, and a push really um, from both sets of guidelines to use, uh, to forego injectables, to not use the aminoglycosides anymore. 
um, and to use all oral treatment regimens focusing on the fluoroquinolones and linazolid as our repurposed drugs and um, bedaquilin, which was a new uh, MDR approved drug. So the first new drug for TB in, uh, in decades um, and really focusing on an all oral regimen. The treatment course, however, was still up to two years. 2020 and 2021, we now have two trials. The first one has been published. Um, the second one is finished, but not published yet. Both looking at six month regimens, all oral, six months for both MDR and XDRTB. So this is a major game changer again for MDR and XDRTB. Um, so the first trial uh, is the NYX trial. Um, and that is looking at two new drugs, so bedaquilin, pretominid, and linazolid, uh, being our repurposed drug. And the six, this three drug regimen was given for six months. Um, uh, it was a single arm open label study. Um, and remember that the background overall success rate for treating MDR TB was 56%, and for XDR TB in South Africa was only 14%. And so 89% of the XDR patients um, became culture negative and met the primary endpoint and 92% of the MDR patients getting the six month all oral regimen um, had uh, met the primary endpoint. Um, and the results have been sustained out to uh, 12 months, I believe. And you can see the difference in the number of pills here. It's really striking. Um, TB Practical is um, a Doctors Without Borders study. It was a randomized clinical, uh, randomized controlled clinical trial, um, which added moxifloxacin uh, to the BPAL regimen. And again, given for six months, it was actually stopped early because the findings were so positive. It has not been published yet, though. Um, there are many trials in process, so these are treatment trials in process for drug susceptible TB, um, and you can see the lowest one here, the truncate TB trial, is looking at a two-month duration um, using new drugs, um, some of which are um, uh, like bedaquilin, um, some of some of the newer drugs which have been uh, developed really for MDR TB, but work on drug susceptible TB as well. So down to two months. Um, and then many ongoing trials as well for multi-drug resistant and extremely drug resistant TB. So in my last minute or two, um, you know, as in every, uh, in every disease in every sphere, we know that there's been a lot of healthcare disruption in the last two years and TB is no exception. This is in India, um, you can see in April of 2020, these are TB cases that were reported to the, to the health departments and a major dip here when lockdown occurred in April of 2020. Um, this is South Africa. And again, in March, when the biggest lockdown occurred, there was a, um, a steep decline in the number of cases um, being reported and TB tests being done. Um, the WHO did some modeling and estimates um, that we, uh, we could see an extra um, uh, three to 400,000 deaths from tuberculosis per year um, because of the COVID pandemic. Um, and, you know, bringing us back sort of to this slide I showed first, um, um, you know, our peak of TB back in the 90s that we saw was really preceded by a steep decline in TB. So TB had really fallen off. Um, and as a result, there was really reduced funding for pub public health and for tuberculosis control measures in general. There was a lot of ongoing social upheaval, crowding, homelessness, especially in cities, um, a rise in drug resistant TB, as well as spread in congregate settings like correctional facilities. Um, and that really all led to this major spike and resurgence in TB that we saw um, in the 90s. And, you know, if you use that as a parallel or a lesson, um, again, we've had a reduction over the last several decades of TB globally, um, but this modeling predicts that we may see an additional 6 million cases 
uh, in the next five years and an additional 1.4 million deaths. Um, and of course, the countries that have had the largest COVID-19 outbreaks are the ones that have seen the largest reductions in the number of TB cases reported. Um, and so this could lead to a major resurgence of tuberculosis over the next few years uh, without mitigation. So, you know, can we mitigate the impact on TB care? And I'm just going to skip ahead to my last slide or two. Um, uh, you know, TB may be missed, diagnoses may be delayed in the setting of COVID surges, the overlapping, overlapping symptoms uh, being a respiratory illness. Um, it really require that we remain sort of on alert for possible TB disease. Um, can we leverage the advances we've seen in uh, during the COVID pandemic, looking at molecular diagnostics, rapid vaccine development, digital health, real-time reporting of disease and transmission, um, and leverage that to use in, uh, in the progress uh, in tuberculosis? At the same time, continue to use the advances that have been developed so far with shorter treatments, simpler testing, um, and TB vaccine candidates. Um, and so, if we can do all of those things um, and focus on the advances in LTBI and TB disease in terms of treatment shortening, um, then hopefully we can leverage uh, what's happened in the last two years to, you know, not fall too far behind in tuberculosis. Um, so I think we'll see a lot more on uh, on what is going on with the TB burden in the next five years or so. Uh, we don't know exactly what will happen as of yet. Um, this is a picture from World TB Day from a long time ago because my kid is not a baby anymore. Um, but being a a TB advocate at a very young age. Um, and this is the CME information again. And thank you again for this invitation. Patrick, thank you uh, for um, this overview of this incredibly and uh, progressively more complex topic uh, over time. And uh, um, the uh, going through this continuum from late TB to active disease, screening, treatment, and advances that are going on in the future that uh, that we can look uh, that hopefully we can look forward to. Um, uh, just a quick question to start. And I'll ask people to either raise their hand or uh, please uh, put some things in the uh, in the chat box if we can get that up. Uh, actually, uh, just a quick thing around like the people of latent TB. You noted that there's uh, you know maybe twenty percent get complete treatment and they are in clustered communities at times. Um, is, what's the role for screening after treatment uh, in, in these populations? So, unfortunately, we don't have a, a test of cure, and I think that makes this process, you know, inherently harder. You tested me, I took my medication, and now you can't tell me that it's really, truly gone. Um, and, and so that's really an issue with the testing. Um, the, the, the tests tend to remain positive. So your IGRA, your tuberculin skin test will likely remain positive despite treatment. Um, but that highlights, uh, highlights uh, sort of a um, role for education um, and educating our communities on sort of what to expect and and why you know why they're being offered this treatment. Thanks. Uh, other comments or questions for Dr. Patuala? I have a question. Um, yeah, please. Uh, so yeah. I, I'm very fortunate. For those of you who don't know, I have an expert uh, tuberculologist next door to me, right in the office next door. So she is great and always gives me advice. So she helped me yesterday with a consult. We had an emergency department and I realized I didn't really know much about it. And it was, I showed her the CT scan and it looked like tuberculosis. But then when my fellow and I went down there and my fellow speaks Spanish, we, we got the information that, you know, he was treated seven years ago in Brooklyn. He was hospitalized for two months, got six more months of therapy. So my question for you, Dr. Patrawala, is what is our responsibility in follow-up of patients, for example, because you saw his chest x-ray, he has extensive disease. What is follow-up on, you know, these patients? Well, I mean, it's not, I will say that it's not great. Most patients are discharged the day or the day after they complete their TB treatment. 
Occasionally, we will continue to see a patient or two who had really extensive disease if we're worried about post-TB complications like bronchiectasis and hemoptysis and that kind of thing. But, but mostly they're discharged and many of these people don't necessarily have primary care or have uh, uh, health insurance um, and can go get follow-up. In terms of follow-up from the public health sphere, if he's ill, if he's coughing, if he has symptoms and signs of tuberculosis, then you know he should be referred to the public health, the local public health department, so that we can follow up um, and ensure you know that he completed treatment. And and so there is a pathway to communicate with other health departments outside of the state, outside of your county, to verify that somebody completed treatment. Um, and we can usually get that information pretty quickly. And once they've completed treatment, do they need other follow up? I mean, like on an annual basis or just because I mean, there's no getting chest x rays on them. No, there's no guidance to to do that. Although there, I think there is a tremendous burden of, you know, lung disease and lung health in, in people who've had extensive TB, but, but that's not part of the guidance. I mean, we certainly try and get people into primary care. Um, but that doesn't always happen. Thank you. Dr. Fatual, I'm, I'm sorry our time is up. Um, I'm sure we could talk about this for, for a lot, lot longer, um, but really appreciate uh, this really uh, uh, really great overview and that highlights all the complexity and uh, why TB still remains so critically important and uh, uh, how relevant it is for us to really maintain the vigilance on this. So. I want to thank you. Thanks for all your work in the Lattimore Clinic and the TB Center that uh, you have been doing uh, and that uh, the program has been doing for a long time. We, you know, it's really a wonderful and I think great service. Thank you all uh, who joined this morning for this great talk and I hope uh, you learned a great deal today. I wish you a great rest of the day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.